Good morning, everybody. Thank you guys again so much for all your hard work this weekend. Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 6, verses 56 through 69. Uh, We're going to pick up the action just after Jesus has miraculously fed 5,000, and he now faces one of the first setbacks in his ministry as many of his disciples abandon him. So let us stand as together we encounter God's word. Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too. Do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. Almighty God, we ask now that you would come in power and by your spirit, that we would seek in this word something that would penetrate into our hearts and shine light on those darkened places. We ask this in the name of the word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Well, I want to get started this morning by asking you a question. Uh, Have you ever been to a restaurant and you have eaten something so good that the memory of that meal, of that taste, just kind of stays with you for the rest of your life? And when something comes along to trigger that memory, it creates this kind of craving in you that makes it just about impossible for you to think about something else. Who's with me? Anybody of you had this experience? All right, all of you are just admitting that you're not going to listen to the rest of the sermon. You're already at lunch. That's cool. Well, for me, uh, the thing that creates this craving in me is this homemade white chocolate ice cream with fresh strawberries from Cafe Fiori in Lake Tahoe. That's good. (laughs) My wife and I went there on our honeymoon, and I have been trying to concoct all kinds of mental schemes since then to figure out how I can get back just so I can get a taste. I mean, that's what it's like to have a craving for something. And it's not just food. I mean, surfers describe getting that perfect wave. My my buddy Dave Ludwig, when he was on staff here, he always used to catch him doodling waves and barrels in his notebook when he should have been paying attention in staff meetings. Sometimes you find this passion that's just so good. Or you experience something so deep that your whole life gets turned around by an encounter, by a glimpse, by this feeling. And all the other noise that's in your head and in your heart just kind of gets filtered out to the one thing. If you've ever experienced something like that, then you know that you can spend the rest of your life chasing after that thing. And when you find something so beautiful, so true, you just want to be back in its presence. I mean, that's that's what it's like to fall in love, right? 
Well, I think something like that is what's humming along beneath the surface of John chapter 6. Jesus is letting his disciples know that he is the only longing that leads to life. And as I mentioned at the beginning, chapter starts with an episode that's recorded in all of the Gospels. Jesus is feeding 5,000 with just a few loaves and fish. And the people, I mean, they're hooked This is one of those moments when Jesus has this massive spike in his popularity. He brings bread to the crowds and they're all here for it. In verse 34, the disciples hear him say, "Uh, Sir, always give us this bread. In other words, they're saying, we like what you're about, Jesus. You just, you keep on doing the magic bread thing and you are going to have followers, you know, your ministry is going to take off. Then a little later on, when these disciples are following him, Jesus more or less says, Look, I know some of you are just here for the show, but I can give you something way better than loaves and fish. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst again. I wonder if you can remember where you were when you first encountered those words and they rang true for you. You tasted the bread of life and you knew that it was good. You experienced the love of your Christ and and, and you realized that you wanted to chase after him for the rest of your life. Because here's the deal with the gospel. When Jesus breaks bread, there is enough to go around for everybody. When Jesus lays down his life and becomes the broken bread, the living bread that's broken for the sin of the world, there is enough for everyone. But as we come to the end of this series in which we have been looking at the character of Jesus, we find this question that Jesus asks his disciples staring us right in the face. Is this all you'll ever want? Have you come to the table? Have you, have you tasted? Have you known that this is what you're going to want forever? Or do you find yourself wondering, yeah, I mean, he's good and everything. I don't know about him being everything. That's what the rest of John 6 is about. But it's not just John 6. I mean, this is a question that pops up again and again throughout Scripture In the Old Testament book of Joshua, the people of Israel are pretty much facing the same question. They are, you know, in this place where God is recounting all the things that he has done for the Israelites. He has uh, released them from bondage. He's uh, rescued them from the pursuing Egyptians. He has rained down bread from heaven. Taste and see that the Lord is good, the psalmist would later write. Israel has indeed tasted that God is good. But as Joshua is getting ready to take his people into the promised land, he gets haunted by this question, God, are we going to want you even after you have already given us everything we want? Or are you what we want? Will you be enough? Will we forget the taste? That's really the question because you and I, we... We forget all the time. Now, I got to admit, in some ways, this is a pretty weird part of Scripture. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I I tend to uh, kind of romanticize the people of the Bible. You know, like I'm watching this movie, and they're there with Jesus, and he just kind of casts this magic spell over him, and they can, you know, literally see the divinity in him, and they're just, they're, they're compelled to follow wherever he goes and do whatever he says, and you, you think to yourself, well, how could you not? I mean, he's Jesus, right? But then you come across stories like this, and the illusion is shattered like that, that it would have been easier for you and me if we had been there just to believe, Because get this, almost directly after Jesus feeds the 5,000, after he tells them that he is the only thing that they'll ever want or need, I mean, these people, they've seen the miracles, they've seen the healings. John notes that these are not the crowds, these are disciples. These are people who've been around Jesus for his whole ministry. And then he starts in at verse 51, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven And whoever eats my flesh will live forever. And it just gets awkward. 
I mean, you and I, we hear this story with 2,000 years of hindsight. We interpret this story through the, the lens of the Last Supper, where Jesus equates his body broken for the sins of the world with the, the bread that we break at dinner time. But can you imagine how absolutely crazy this would have sounded to people who heard it for the first time? The people are hearing this, and Jesus notes that they're grumbling. I mean, they got to be thinking, like, wait, 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 this, this guy who gives out the bread, that's the Joseph's son, right? Yeah, the, the one who followed in the family business, the, occasionally teaches some really good sermons in the synagogue. That Jesus, right? Oh, he's saying he's bread. Bread guy is saying he's bread now. And we need to eat his body. Peace out, Jesus. It's a loose translation of the Greek there. I mean, just like that, all of these people who've been following him when he was the one who gave them what they want, they're now kind of scrambling around trying to find a second opinion. Especially when he tells them that he's all that they'll ever need. And the sixth chapter of John's gospel gives us two kind of extreme reasons for their walking away. And the first is that this whole bread of life thing is just too big of a claim to stomach. I mean, Jesus appears to them as just so ordinary, a flesh and blood human. And here he is claiming to be everything. And they might have thought just like we do. You know, we live in this, this crazy, complicated world. If God is going to show up, he's going to be way more obvious than some carpenter's son who hangs out with fishermen and tax collectors. And so they bail, and they go, and they chase after the next Messiah who can give them what they want, someone who will give them the bread without all these claims about being God. And maybe some of you are in that boat. And if that's not you, you at least know some people who kind of cringe whenever it is that Christians make this claim that Jesus is the only thing that can meet the world's needs. Or maybe you're more like the second reason that people walked away at the other end of the spectrum. They thought Jesus was just too demanding. I mean, he's asking for too much. This, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it, they say? It's all good and well that Jesus wants to feed the multitudes with bread that never leaves anyone hungry. I'm okay with the idea of Jesus wanting to take on the consequences of my sin. But I'm not so sure about this whole business of taking up my cross. I mean, can't I have you, Jesus, and just live the life I want? Well, as it so happens, the two reasons that people walked away from Jesus at Capernaum are pretty much two reasons that people walk away from him today. For some, Jesus is just too ordinary. I think truth is too complicated to fit into one story, no matter how good, no matter how virtuous, no matter how beautiful the person is at the center of it. For others, Jesus might just be too much. I mean, Christianity might be true, but it expects an awful lot. Everyone who is a follower of Jesus knows what it's like to get pulled between these two extremes of the spectrum. I mean, a lot of us, we can look back in our lives and we can think of the times when just about anything was more important to us and more appetizing to us than Jesus. We tell ourselves, well, you know, I'll get to that whole religion business once I shore up some things in the real world. But after a while, what we pursue in the name of the freedom to chase after that which we most need it just it gets its hooks in us and causes us to crave something else and pulls us in a different direction. Maybe you're in one of those places right now. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to remember the taste. Remember where you were when you first understood Jesus' words, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. After many followed him, began to turn away, Jesus turns to his disciples, and maybe he's trying to force the issue. Maybe he's just really sad. But he says, what about you? Are you going to walk away? Is that what you want? Do you want to leave? It's another way of asking the question that Jesus asked Bartimaeus that Chap preached on a couple weeks ago. 
What do you want? And according to James Smith, a philosopher, that is the first, last, and most fundamental question of Christian discipleship. What do you want? It's a question that's actually behind just about every other question that Jesus asks. Will you come and follow me is just another way of asking, what do you want? So is the question that he asks Peter a little later on in the gospel. Do you love me more than these? It's a, it's a way of asking, what do you want? It's a, it's a question that cuts to the heart. And you'll notice that Jesus doesn't turn to them, and he doesn't turn to you and to me and say, what do you know? He doesn't say to them even, what do you believe? He says, what? I mean, do you want to leave? It's the most piercing question that Jesus can ask his disciples because we are shaped so powerfully by what we want. Smith puts it this way. Our wants and our longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behavior flow. Our wants reverberate from our heart, the epicenter of the human person. Thus, Scripture counsels, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Discipleship, we might say, is a way to curate your heart, to be attentive to and intentional about what you love. Friends, what if discipleship is more about hungering and thirsting after God than it is about simply acknowledging the right things about Him? Jesus' question to these disciples, do you want to go or are you going to follow me? Is a question about whether or not they are willing to align their hearts with his. To want what God wants, to to desire what God desires, to long for a God and to, to crave for a kingdom and to allow that craving to shape the way that we see the world. He wants you to know him, but he doesn't want to just drop a bunch of ideas in your head. He wants you to trust him, which is exactly why he is aiming for your longings. He wants you to love him. Because he's not just some smooth preacher out to blow your mind. He is the Lord and he wants to invade your heart. There's a lot hanging on this question. And it sets the stage for a pretty amazing answer. Peter says, Lord, to whom can we go? You're speaking the words that explain myself to me. You explain the whole world to me. You have these words of eternal life. You you are life. Suddenly, Peter realizes that he has got front row tickets to the best show in town. He has had a taste. And he knows that nothing else can satisfy I don't know where you were when you first considered the question that Jesus asks his disciples. For me, I was a 16-year-old kid, hurting, pretty cynical about religion, hadn't stepped foot in a church in about six or seven years, and then God showed up. I had this encounter with him that took place in that summer, and I pretty much spent the better part of that season in the mountains, more or less in solitude sort of decided to hit the reset button on my life. Kind of dramatic, (laughs) 16-year-old. Think first wave emo, but without the eyeliner and stuff. Like, (laughs) might have a kind of a sense of who I was. Anyway, somehow in the midst of the beauty of that place that I was in, I, I began to read scripture with a new set of eyes. And God showed up as, not as a, Category, not as a concept, but as this person who was present in Jesus. And I don't think I can do it any you know, justice by saying it to you, but somehow in the midst of all the, the beauty of places like Yellowstone and Glacier National Park, it was enough to just kind of pull me out of myself for a little bit. And I remember sitting by a campfire on the Columbia River reading Psalm 8, and I came across those words, what is man that thou art mindful of him in the midst of this starlit sky and I remember feeling so small and yet so profoundly loved. But the thing that really did it for me was reading the Sermon on the Mount which Chap has been asking us to do all summer long. 
And I found in his words a life radically different than I expected. But I also found that this could lead to abundance should anyone desire or dare to follow after him. And I remember deciding that I wanted to dare. I had gotten just a taste and it was enough to start the craving. And don't get me wrong, there, there are all kinds of times since then where my faith has wavered, when I have doubted the call that God has put on my life. Uh, there are all kinds of things that will reduce me in an instant back to being that 16-year-old kid who's afraid and wants to just run away from everything. But I can never forget the taste. I can never forget what it was like to know that he is good and that he is present. I don't know what's going on in your heart. Maybe you have come to a spot where you've felt like just chucking it all. Maybe work is too much of a grind and, or maybe you don't have enough work. Maybe the promises that you made on your wedding day seem more like an aspiration than something that could really be lived out every day. Maybe you have been really disappointed in church. What you thought was going to be this place to help you see the kingdom of God come about in living color is just one bad committee meeting after another. And so maybe you've turned elsewhere. Maybe you've turned to, to politics or you've, you've turned to throwing yourself into work or maybe just buying a whole bunch of stuff only to find that there's enough brokenness to go around. And none of those things that promise and answer come across as credibly as the one who says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. If that's you, maybe you've understood Peter's question. To whom can we go? You got the words of life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Friends, I think this is the most honest declaration of faith in Scripture. A lot of ways to describe it. Grit is one. Determination to stick it out. Faithfulness is another, but I think the the best one is love. This is what it means to love God, to hold on to Him in the knowledge that in His broken body, And in his poured out blood, you will receive the best meal ever. Because what you crave is God himself. Friends, as you leave this place, I encourage you to just do one thing. Remember the taste. Remember where you were when you experienced the grace of God for the first time. And if that's not you, if you haven't experienced that yet, know that he stands ready to greet you with open arms. Folks who will be happy to pray with you in the prayer room after the service. But remember where you were found. May that taste stay ever on your lips. May the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you as you leave this place. Amen.